Welcome back to Eye on South Asia. That's right. Sanjeev, we have another scientific story. We're, we're all about science today. <laughs> so, um, our headline is scientists get $2.9 million to create a shape-shifting nanomaterial. That's right. I'm, I'm assuming that you're a science buff, so I'm going to have you explain what a shape-shifting nanomaterial is. I'm not a science buff, <laughs> but I find this story interesting. Earlier okay. we discussed about scientists in India, mm -hmm. how they are trying to crack uh, monsoon code, and um, now we're going to talk about scientists in the USA. Uh, Mr. Right. Paras Prasad, a professor at the University at Buffalo, and his team received a 2.9 million grant from the US Air Force of uh, US Air Force Office of Scientific Research to design shape-shifting nanomaterials. That, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're gonna use that. And uh, Prasad is actually executive director of UB's Institute for Lasers, Photonics, and Biophotonics, is leading an international team for the project, you know. And I think this would actually uh, add a, a new dimension into US Air Force Research Department, because what they are trying to come up with it, it will help uh, Air Force, U.S. Air Force, a lot in order to improve their own technology also. And one of their goals is to contribute to the fundamental understanding of how the, the spatial arrangement of uh, nanoscale components and materials affect their optical and, um, and the plasmatic properties. So this is going to be interesting. And of course, Indian scientist um, you know, Paras Prasad mm -hmm. and his team received 2.9 million grant from U.S. Air Force. So that would be interesting. That sounds great, yeah, and you're saying that they're going to be using the science to yes. improve the their, U.S. Their Air Force. infrastructure and material, yep. Very nice. All right, so let's move to our story about the Consul General, uh, Mr. Prabhu Dial, and he was in a, a court case with his former maid, and mm. she had filed a lawsuit against him and his family for alleged mistreatment. Mm. And the lawsuit claimed that Dial, as well as his uh, his wife and daughter, um, made her to work morning till night, just um, very long hours, and she had come from India. So this is kind of a familiar story we've heard before with other cases, but what happened it is... Actually, actually, it has happened to uh, many individuals, yes. um, and many high-profile, I should say, individuals, and um, some of them have an um, Indian-American origin as well. Mm -hmm. In this case, um, India's Council General um, of New York, Mr. Prabhu Dayal, his wife and their daughter was involved in this lawsuit by Santosh Bharadwaj as she claimed that she was not treated properly from this family, and she was forced to work from morning till midnight, was not um, you know, provided proper accommodation and whatnot. There were so many things listed mm -hmm. um, you know, in this lawsuit. But Consul General Prabhu Dayal had made it very clear from day one that this is a, these are false accusations. He's being framed up, his family is being framed up. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I think judge found out that um, Prabhu Dayal's daughter was not uh, involved in any wrongdoing, so her name was dropped. I think Akansha Dayal, her name was dropped later on. Mm -hmm. But lawsuit continued, and now, according to this latest report, it, it has been settled because apparently not much of it has been found uh, you know, uh, against Prabhu Dayal and his wife to right. find them guilty. Yeah. So it has been settled. Right. And there are no details put out in terms of the actual set settlement, but um, there was also a counter uh, yeah. charge that and Mr. Dial are, um, right. Mr. made Dial's against uh, right. the maid uh, for defamation, I guess, so but that was are, thrown out. There are 30 days now uh, if, if the other party wants to uh, counter offer something or do something, but it is expected that this will this They will settle will be within 30 days. Exactly. Exactly. So it's... At least good to know that that case has come to a close. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go back to India with some of their new ideas. Mm -hmm. And we actually saw in the news a few weeks ago that IKEA. Idea was, from IKEA? Yes. <laughs> uh, IKEA <laughs> is planning to open up some stores in right. India. And that, that's about 25 outlets, and they're planning to invest 1.5 billion euros. That's a lot. So of that's, money. yeah, very big projects that they have going mm. on. And um, 
in the beginning of the year, the government actually removed the foreign investment caps from FDI, the FDI, from the FDI, yeah FDI. exactly from the single brand retail, and so this kind of opened up the doors to some of the retailers to come back in because I know they were closed off for a while and there was you know they were very discouraged, hmm. but now we have slowly some retailers coming back in, and IKEA is um, actually planning to do this. Uh, kind of movement over a 10 to 20 year period. 15 to 20 year 15 period. To 15 20 to 20 year, year period. period to invest this 1.5 billion euro and mm -hmm. having 25 outlets in, in a country like India. Right, and the reason for this is that the government has actually, I guess, required that retailers source about 30% of their um, business from local and uh, medium-sized firms from within the country. Right. And this is challenging when it comes to a foreign brand coming into the country? Well, it's a challenging in a way because India's um, tax laws, um, India's, you know, um, inviting uh, foreign companies to invest, those laws and the rules are very complicated. They are very, very complex. Even companies in India, Indian companies in India mm -hmm. are also, you know, uh, having negative effect because of that. Somewhere government needs to change it. Now, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh said that IKEA's future plans in India it shows, um, you know, their strong confidence in India, investors really strong confidence in India, and a bright future for Indians in India or for the other companies. But Indian government must make these tax laws and other rules, they must simplify that. Yeah. Because we have had, you know, foreign direct investment FDI issue that dragged too long and that kind of got pushed back. Walmart uh, tried b their best to enter into Indian market and even invest more and more, mm -hmm. but apparently they were pushed back. So now with this IKEA deal, we'll see how it goes forward. Only foreign company right now, which is doing very well in India, with Coca-Cola. And right. they announced they're going to invest, I think, uh, About three billion, three billion, three billion do dollars more, exactly. and um, you know to make their brand even more popular in India. Mm -hmm. But um, just like I say, Indian government must make these laws really simplified. Right, and the stakes are high for all of these companies coming sure. in. For example, with Coke, they have Pepsi, who's their big competitor in India, and they actually have the upper hand in right. India. And with IKEA, you know, they want to be able to compete with the local. Um, national businesses like Big Bazaar and those right. sorts of things so they all have their competition cut out for them right. and so they really want to take advantage of this really growing middle class and they're ready to spend spend like crazy. So. And I, actually you know I support this IKEA's plan um, mm -hmm. uh, you know their investment plan in, the, in India because IKEA's furniture as you know it, it it comes in a smaller size, it's, and, and it's beautifully designed, and it would fit perfectly well uh, for homes in India because Indian homes are not that large, right. and in the smaller rooms, I think IKEA's furniture would fit very well. So, so that, you know, that would work out very well if IKEA is able to enter in the Indian market. Right. Okay, so we have um, one interesting story about a, a jeweler in yeah. New York and so we're going to move back to the U.S. We've we've spent a lot of time in India, so okay. <laughs> um, now we're in local local community yes, right here in New York. Exactly. So a jeweler, uh, two of them have actually been using uh, elephant ivory, and they've been selling them illegally in their jewelry stores here. Mm. So we have two people. Um, one of us, one of them is Indian American Mukesh Gupta, who owns Raja Jewels Raja and. Jewels. His right, right, Raja right. Jewels right. and his friend, I believe his friend, Johnson Chung Chien Lu and his company, New York Jewelers Mart, they've both been selling elephant, elephant ivory, ivory made items in their stores and these items are worth reportedly of about two million dollars. Exactly. And you know, poaching of elephants and this whole sale of you know, elephant Elevator. ivory and this sort of thing is completely illegal. It's against the law. It's absolutely yes. against the law, right. Unless you have uh, a license to sell mm. ivory, which they don't, you know, so they... You could have a license to sell? I, I, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that you, have, you could have a license to <laughs> sell I mean, if it's illegal... If it's illegal, then how <laughs> then could you, why have, would a you have a license? Right. That, that's an interesting point, and, okay. you know, I, I thought that myself, but they didn't have licenses. Right. That's what matters. So um, they have to forfeit all of their items that they were selling, and... Along with that, they have to pay about forty-five thousand dollars to the Wildlife Conservatory Society yep. um, because you know 
we're all about preserving animals and this poaching is just really making elephants in Africa especially going extinct. Yep, true. So. That's actually, you know, I mean, the story doesn't say a whole lot that where was the source actually and, and how, where were they, how were they getting this elephant ivory, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. But I like to find out where actually was it coming from. These jewelers are getting it from somewhere, whether in the U.S. or outside right. U.S. Yes, we know that, you know, the actual source, I mean, the elephants were coming from Asia and Africa, right. but we don't know. They could be routed to, to, through several countries, you know, like England. Right. And, Europe and that yeah, sort of thing. So we really don't know. Right. Um, but anyway, it's illegal, it's illegal, <laughs> and uh, and uh, they help plead guilty, as as uh, what I understand, right? This New York jewelers, they help plead guilty. Exactly. And they're going to pay fine as well as donate. They're they're going to have to do their penance and right. conserve, you know, contribute to the cause of right. conserving okay. animals and wildlife. So, you know, there's. There's, uh, there have been several incidents here in New York City mm. where, you know, you got to be careful when shopping to see what's authentic and where things are actually coming from. There was another story here in the, written in the Indian Express about um, a man who was selling idols from India, mm. from Tamil Nadu actually, mm. in, um, and he sold it to art muse museums here in New York City and he was also using it in art galleries and that sort of thing. Okay. So he was kind of smuggling, right. you know, these religious idols and people just thought they were great, you know. Right. They were um, even in the MoMA, the Museum mm. of Modern mm. Art, mm. you know, these great uh, galleries and museums and no idea where these things are coming but from. But it was all illegal? Yes. Okay. It was all illegal. All right. So, you know, it, it helps to know where your true. items are coming true. from. True, true. So, <laughs> All right, so we're going to take another short break and we're going to have some really interesting entertainment stories and sports stories as well. And we'll be right back on Eye on South Asia.